quick note, I do think that the Kunal Differential Geometry book is a little bit more rigorous. It's a little bit more organized as far as identifying topological features, bringing up things from just regular real analysis. Um, so it's a little bit more modern seeming. However, there is still a huge amount of overlap between what's in this book and what's in the Kuno book. So I wouldn't discount the Kreisig book right off the bat just for that. But, you know, there's lots of good stuff to go over in these. What's up, you guys? Welcome back to another Differential Geometry stream. Today is episode eight. I'm running my dishwasher right now, so hopefully you can't hear that too loudly in the background. I was going to do a review today of the entire second chapter that was finished last stream from the Differential Geometry book by Erwin Kreisig, which I've been reading in the past eight, nine streams now. But I started to go and film a review, but it was just really, really wide and encompassing and it touched on so much stuff that I realized it would be better if I just read first one chapter from this different differential geometry book because in the review I started to compare this differential geometry book with the main text for MIT's open courseware differential geometry course and I had been going through their lecture notes, tried a couple of the problems from the assignments and while there is a lot of overlap between this book and the MIT open courseware textbook um, there is one chapter or section from the equivalent theory of curves chapter from the MIT open courseware textbook that I figured it would be a good idea to just read that entire section and then in next stream I'll get to a more comprehensive wide-ranging review of the theory of curves. So if you can't already tell the other book that I'm going to be reading from is called Differential Geometry, go figure, Curves, Surfaces, Manifolds, and it's by Wolfgang Kuhnel. That's K-U with an umlaut, H-N-E-L. So let's get right into it. And the section I'm going to be reading from is called Curves in Minkowski Space, R sub one, superscript three. So that's three-dimensional real space has the uh, subscript one. And the reason why I'm reading this also as its own stream in and of itself is because this is directly relevant to theoretical physics applications, specifically in general relativity. And so I like to touch on the applications of this math stuff because I'm not a huge fan of doing math just for math's sake. I don't get off on just how complex, intricate, abstract, however you want to get the math. If there's no immediate application or if it's just you know, math for math's sake, I'm not a fan of that. You have to have an application. You have to have something that can connect to the real world with, connect it to physics, connect it to philosophy. This comes up in the beginning of Ed Witten's uh, high energy physics lectures online. So I figured I would read this as its own stream. And without any further ado, curves in Minkowski space, R sub one superscript three. Up to now, we have been considering Euclidean space as our ambient space. The Euclidean inner product between x and y is equal to the sum on the index i from 1 to 3 of x sub i times y sub i. Implies, among other things, that the length of c dot of the tangent on a regular curve c of t never vanishes. However, there are good reasons for allowing more general inner products, which are not necessarily positive definite, as the Euclidean product is positive definite. In the special theory of relativity, for example, one works in a space-time of three plus one dimensions, where time is viewed as a dimension. In the direction of this coordinate, the inner product has a negative sign. Similarly, one can consider three-dimensional space as a space of dimension 2 plus 1, treating some of the dimensions differently from the others. One can interpret this as a toy model 
for the special theory of relativity, but in physics, other theories are considered which live in two plus one dimensions. First definition is of a Minkowski space. The space R sub one superscript three is defined as a space to be the usual three dimensional R vector space, real vector space, consisting of vectors x1, x2, x3, such that its entries x1, x2, and x3 are in the real numbers, but endowed with the inner product. So if we have two vectors which belong to this vector space named x and y, and we take the inner product of them, then this inner product is given by negative x1, y1, plus x2, y2, plus x3, y3. This space is called the Minkowski space, or Lorentz space. Tangent vectors are defined precisely as in the case of Euclidean space R3. A vector x is said to be space-like if the inner product between that vector and itself is positive or greater than zero. Time-like if the inner product of the vector x with itself is less than zero. And light-like or isotropic or a null vector if the inner product between x and itself is equal to zero, but that vector x itself is not zero. The set of all null vectors of R sub 1 superscript 3 forms what is called the light cone. <clears throat> okay, so we have a note here. If the inner product on x with itself is written in the form negative gamma squared t squared plus x2 squared plus x3 squared, where t denotes the time parameter and gamma the velocity of light, then the light cone represents the propagation of light in the x2, x3 plane. In coordinates, for the vector x1, x2, x3, we have that x1 squared equals x2 squared plus x3 squared, and x1 is non-zero. Then we have a figure here which shows a light cone in Minkowski space with a vertical x1 axis. And this is very, very reminiscent of the conic section shape that if you were to take slices throughout this set of two cones, you can obtain points, lines, parabolas, etc. Moving on. In R sub 1 superscript 3, the rules of calculus remain the same as in Euclidean space R3, so that we can speak of immersions or regular curves, just as in the Euclidean case. We come to a definition. A regular curve C, which is from an interval I to R sub 1 superscript 3, is called space-like if the inner product on C dot with itself is greater than zero everywhere, time-like if the inner product on C dot with itself is less than zero everywhere, or light-like or isotropic or a null curve if the inner product on C dot with itself is equal to zero everywhere. An example is that the hyperbola x1 squared equals x2 squared plus 1 and x3 equals zero is space-like. This can be seen using the parameterization C of t equals hyperbolic cosine of t, hyperbolic sine of t, and zero as each of its three respective entries. Since c dot of t equals hyperbolic sine of t, hyperbolic cosine of t, and then zero, which implies that the inner product of c dot with itself is equal to one, the parameter t is actually the arc length. Similarly, the hyperbola x sub one squared equals x sub two squared minus one and x sub three equals zero is time-like with a similar parameterization, c of t equals hyperbolic sine of t, hyperbolic cosine of t, zero. The line c of t equal to t, t, and zero as each of its three respective entries is isotropic. This line lies, with the exception of the point for t equals zero, entirely on the light cone. And we come to a lemma. A regular curve C, which is from I to R sub 1 superscript 3, which is space-like or time-like everywhere, can be parameterized by arc length in the sense that the inner product of C dot with itself is equal to positive negative 1 is valid everywhere. 
For a curve which is everywhere light-like, this is not possible in general, but one can parametrize a light-like line in such a way that C double dot is equal to zero. These parametrizations are not unique, but only determined up to a translation T which maps to A times T plus B. <clears throat> the parameter is therefore also referred to as an affine parameter. The proof of this statement for space-like or time-like curves is similar to that given in 2.2. For isotropic lines, this statement is quite trivial. And these exercises are left to the reader. In order to get derivative equations of Frenet type, so going back to a lot of Frenet, everything is called Frenet something or other in this book, at least in this chapter. So it just kind of reiterates the influence that Frenet had on the theory of curves. We first observed that in R sub 1 superscript 3, a modified vector product of two vectors a and b can be defined by requiring the relation given by the inner product of the cross product of a and b with c is equal to the determinant of a, b, and c for all c. In the same way, one can define three frames as follows or Frenet frames, or TPB frames. For two vectors, E sub 1 and E sub 2, for which the inner product of E sub i with itself is equal to positive negative 1, and the inner product of E sub 1 and E sub 2 is equal to 0, a third is defined by E sub 3 given by the cross product between E sub 1 and E sub 2, and these three vectors form an orthonormal 3 frame, or Frenet frame, or TPB frame if you're in calculus 3. If we define epsilon and nu in 1 or negative 1 by the inner product on E sub 1 with itself is equal to epsilon and the inner product of E sub 2 on itself is equal to nu, then it follows that the inner product of E sub 3 on itself is equal to negative epsilon times nu. Hence, each vector x can be uniquely decomposed into its three components. x equals epsilon times the inner product of x and e1 times e1 plus nu times the inner product of x and e2 times e2 minus epsilon times nu times the inner product of x and e3 times e3. And now we come to a theorem. Frenet equations in Minkowski space. Let C be a space-like or time-like curve, which we assume is parametrized by arc length and satisfies that the inner product of C double prime with itself is non-zero. Then this curve introduces a Frenet three frame, E sub one equals C prime, E two equals C double prime, all over the square root of the magnitude of the inner product of C double prime with itself, and E3 equals the cross product of E1 and E2, for which the following Frenet equations hold. Here, epsilon and nu are defined as above just now. So we have the vector E1, E2, E3 prime equals skew symmetric coefficient matrix. I'm not going to read the entries, but this is something that I've gone over in four streams ago, and it keeps on coming up. So Frenet equations, very important. The skew symmetric matrix representation of the equations, also important. So we have that matrix here, and then we have that times vector of E1, E2, E3. The quantities defined by this relation, namely kappa equal to the inner product of E1 prime and E2, and tau equal to the inner product of E2 prime and E3, are called the curvature and torsion of the curve C. So this showing the definitions of curvature and torsion as these inner products is not something that was gone over in the Kreisig differential geometry book. Um, quick note, I do think that the Kunal differential geometry book is a little bit more rigorous. It's a little bit more organized as far as identifying topological features, bringing up things from just regular real analysis. Um, so it's a little bit more modern seeming. However, there is still a huge amount of overlap between what's in this book and what's in the Kuna book. So I wouldn't discount the Kreisig book right off the bat just for that. But you know, there's lots of good stuff to go over in these. 
We have real quick proof of the theorem, as in 2.8, which I haven't read, but it's in an earlier section of this book. We only need to calculate the components of e1 prime, e2 prime, and e3 prime in the Frenet 3 frame. For example, e1 prime equals c double prime equals nu times the inner product of c double prime and e sub 2 times e sub 2, which is equal to nu times kappa times e sub 2. Then we have the inner product of e sub 2 prime and e sub 1, which is equal to the negative inner product of e sub 1 prime and e sub 2, which is equal to negative kappa or negative curvature. And the inner product of e sub 3 prime and e sub 2 is equal to the negative inner product of e sub 2 prime and e sub 3, which is equal to negative tau, negative torsion. To another example, curves with constant curvature and torsion, and I believe this rounds off the section. The following plane curves have constant curvature. C sub 1 of t equals 0 cosine of t sine of t. C 2 of t equals hyperbolic cosine of t, hyperbolic sine of t, 0. And C 3 of t equals hyperbolic sine of t, hyperbolic cosine of t, 0. Here C 1 and C 2 are space-like while C 3 is time-like. Space curves with constant curvature and constant torsion can be obtained as the trajectories of a particle under a helicoidal motion in Minkowski space. The corresponding rotation matrices are discussed in a future section in a future chapter 3.42. One then can add a translation in the direction of the axis of rotation. Depending on a constant A, one gets in this manner the following curves, all with constant curvature and torsion. C4 of t is equal to a t cosine of t sine t, c5 of t is equal to hyperbolic cosine of t, hyperbolic sine of t, and a times t. And we have c sub 6 of t, which is equal to hyperbolic sine of t, hyperbolic cosine of t, and a t. We have a quick remark here. In the n-dimensional pseudo-Euclidean space, r sub k superscript n, with an analogous inner product between x and y, given by the negative sum on the index i from 1 to k of x sub i times y sub i plus the sum on the index j from k plus 1 to n of x sub j times y sub j, and a curve c of s parameterized by arc length in analogous Frenet n frame, e sub 1, etc., through e sub n, with epsilon sub i defined by the inner product of e sub i with itself in 1, negative 1, leads to the following Frenet matrix. And I'm not going to read out the entries of this matrix either, but it's just a generalized n dimensional matrix. No, K is an N by N matrix, okay? I'm not going to read out all the entries, but like I said, it's just a generalization of the 3 by 3 skew symmetric coefficient matrix for the Frenet equations. The proof is essentially the same as the proof of theorem 2.13, the Euclidean case, which I just alluded to. The only change concerns the modified representation of a vector in an orthonormal basis as follows. E sub i prime is equal to the sum on the index j from 1 to n of epsilon sub j times the inner product of E sub i prime with E sub j times E sub j. To see this equation, one can take the inner product of both sides of the equation with a fixed E sub m. We will come back to these pseudo-Euclidean spaces, r sub k superscript n, in chapter 7. And... That's going to be it for today because, like I said, there's a huge review of the theory of curves coming. Like I said, I could have just reviewed in this stream right away chapter 2 of the Chrysig Differential Geometry book. But I think to give it a more robust handling, I want to compare it to the MIT OpenCourseWare chosen textbook, kind of like how I just did go over the MIT OpenCourseWare lecture notes, maybe do a few of the problems from their assignments. Like I said, just to really round out the handling of, different, of differential geometry that I'm doing here. So a little quick stream for you guys, and see you in the next one.
peace.